You're listening to Investify, preaching financial independence and assisting investors to achieve a more flexible and free lifestyle through smart financial planning and real estate investing. If leaving the corporate world and jumping into this thriving industry is what you desire, tune in and listen to stories of like-minded individuals who made the leap to financial independence. Equip yourself with the right tips and tricks to start your real estate journey, making active or passive ventures that are highly profitable and rewarding. Here are your hosts, Craig Kerlop and Ziana McIntyre. What's going on, everybody? You are listening to Investify. My name is Craig Kerlop, aka the Fi Guy, and I'm here with my co-host Ziana McIntyre, aka Z Money. Z is back in the house. Z, I miss you so much. You don't even know. Oh my I was gosh! Like well, dying I... on the inside. <laughs> I like was my wondering. insides were coming on my outsides, and yeah, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't. It was fun, but it wasn't nearly as fun as when you're here. So tell us, what the heck have you been up to? Well, first I got COVID. Actually, first I went to the Invest Her conference, which, by the way, is fantastic. So any women who are wanting to get together with other women and learn about investing, get out there next year. It's such a good conference. Um, Then I got COVID and went to Europe, and I'm finally here. I just had, like, bad internet and all these things. Life has been hard, Craig. Life but here is I am in France with great internet. <laughs> yeah, traveling through <laughs> Europe and going to cool conferences, and but you came That's out true. with you came from that conference and you got a little gift of the, in COVID. And were you you were able to get into <laughs> Europe with COVID? Oh, well, I didn't discover it fully until I had landed, so, yeah. Ah, that's good. So, good point. Bad if you're feeling bears. symptoms and you're about to travel, don't get tested until you until you get to the location. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that, Craig, that, you're making me sound like a true <laughs> jerk. <laughs> that, might, that might be the best advice we get. No, I actually, it's funny enough, I did the same thing. I went to um, Florida over Christmas, and I was like, oh, I don't have time to get tested. And so, I just went. And then got tested in Florida and I had it. So it happens. Um, it's just where we're at. You're these not alone. Days. But we have um, a wonderful guest today. Maybe it's just yeah. me getting back, but I found this to be a really fun episode. And maybe it's because he's talking about SDRs a little bit, and I love that space. But uh, yeah, it sounds like this is your house hacking brother from another mother. Yeah, Isaac. Um, it's funny. Isaac and I had go way, way back. Um, and it, it's astonishing. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, which is like too bad because I just feel like we've got good energy. We've got good connection. We do are doing the same thing, believe the same beliefs. Um, but yeah, we both started at the same time, kind of doing the same thing. And, and he reached out, I guess we grabbed coffee. And then since then, um, you know, I know, I know we've, we've hung out a few times and he's, but he's exploded and I haven't even seen him in a couple of years. And I'm so excited to kind of see his journey and how much he's grown his business and all that good stuff. So yeah, let's, uh, let's bring him on the show. Isaac Archuleta, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing today, dude? Hey, Craig. I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Good to see you, Z. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, man. So good to have you. And this is a this is like a blast from the past. You know, you're one of my OG house hacking friends from like I honestly don't remember where we met. I think it was probably a meetup or something. But um, do you remember where we met? Oh man, I slid in your DMs hard. Uh, I think that I was uh, I was at the gym <laughs> and I heard one of your one of your podcasts, and I was like, oh man, this guy. He gets it, and I think he's in Denver. And then I was like, "Oh, I gotta, I gotta link up with this guy because we're doing the same thing. Um, we were both just baby investors at the time." Yeah, yeah. So it's fun to kind of grow and kind of have see how our journeys kind of grew in, in tandem, yet a little bit, little bit deviations. But that's all good, and we're gonna hear all about your story now. So why don't you take us back to that moment when you were a little baby investor, maybe just before <laughs> that, and tell us when you first heard about financial independence? Oh gosh. Okay. So. Um, Gosh, how did it happen? Well, it happened by accident, actually. So I um, I got out of college and I knew that I wanted to save up some money just for a truck um, out of school. So I was like, okay, well, this responsible thing to do is instead of living downtown, and uh, I think my buddies at the time were paying like a thousand bucks a month to go live downtown. Uh, I wish we could do that today. It's a lot more expensive. Um, but I was like, you know what? I should just save on money and, uh, and live with my parents. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll just do that. So I lived at home with my parents to save up money for this F-150, F-250 that I wanted. I just wanted to buy cash. It was like 60 grand at the time. 
And I saved up 60 grand living at home with my parents. I was just eating every meal that they gave me. Um, I, I don't know what I was saving at the time, probably 2000 bucks a month or something, 3000 bucks a month. And, uh, and I just put all that aside and I was ready to buy this truck. And then my dad was like, Hey, you know, what are your thoughts on maybe picking up a car payment later in life and, um, you know, just buying a house. And then I was like, man, that's kind of a good idea, but I'm afraid cause I don't know how much, you know, how much does that cost? And, you know, my parents give me the advice, man, just put down 20%. And so I was like, well, I mean, that's going to be literally blow out everything that I have, but at least I'll get the payment low. Um, so that was my very first house was a, a little three bedroom, two bathroom house, um, just in the suburbs of Denver, Colorado. And, uh, it had a, a basement that was just all carpeted and it had a, the washing machine and all that stuff down there. Um, so my first house I bought was 20% down and, um, it was pretty cool because I threw a couple roommates in there to help me with the, pay the mortgage payment. Uh, the, the house at the time was 337,000. Um, Hey, Isaac, man, I'm going to interrupt you real quick, bro. Yeah. Um, so so uh, before before we get into the house, I want to talk a little bit more about like what your parents' background is and like that relationship with your parents because, um, you know, a lot of people's parents, it, it's like the opposite, right? Like <laughs> you're the first person to invest in real estate and you're convincing your parents to invest. And so did you kind of yeah. grow up with that? Does your, does your dad have rental real estate or where, where did that kind of come from? No, my parents are not not financially um, savvy or progressive in that respect. My dad's a physician um, and my mom was the back engine office manager for that practice. And so my parents are just, um, they own the building um, that, they, that they operate the practice out of. And that was about it. And they had one other rental property, which was their first house that they just never sold. Uh, and so they have one rental um, from back in the day, but they're not by any means like real estate investors. Um, but they do know that that house is fully paid off and that that basically covers all of their uh, bills for the month. So that's kind of how they got a taste that, you know, what a rental property would look like. OK, so yeah. so, they, so they effectively know what the difference is between like, a, you know, a rich dad, poor dad asset versus liability. And they realize that you were about to buy a liability <laughs> when you could buy an asset to pay for that liability. Yeah. Z, do you, do you have anything to add there? I just think it's really great that they were able to get that light bulb moment for you, even though it wasn't something that they knew. It's interesting how people can kind of influence your life and then take it a whole different direction. So I love seeing that turning point. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man. So now now let's get into the nitty gritty. So, you know, you bought okay. this house. I think you mentioned it was a three bed, two bed in the suburbs of Denver. Mm -hmm. uh, give us give us some more like, you know, what was the price? How did you finance it? Did you use that whole 60 grand? Give us all the juicy details. Yeah. So, I mean, um, so it was a 337,000 um, and I got it right at, right at list and I put down 20%. So that's like $67,400, which wiped me totally clean. I had like two grand to my name, but I was just convinced that I needed to get this 20% down payment to knock off the PMI. You know, I didn't really know any better at the time as far as scaling a portfolio and what I wanted to do. Um, but my mortgage payment was super low. I mean, my mortgage payment was like 1650. Um, and so I was like, well, even for myself as just like a new kid out of school, like I'm not making that much money. It still is kind of heavy. Um, and so I was like, maybe I'll just get some roommates in there. And lo and behold, not many people want to live in the suburbs of Denver. They want to live downtown where it's popping off. So um, they, I had to make it advantageous for them. So I charged 600 bucks a month um, for the three bedrooms. Uh, so I came out to $1,800 of income coming in. And then what happened is I lived for free. Basically, I made $150 by living in the basement. Um, didn't have a closet, didn't have anything to store my clothes in. So I just bought a little Ikea furniture and, uh, and had all my clothes hanging up down in the basement. And that's how I got my first start living for free. And that gave me the savings rate that I needed to propel forward and uh, some velocity to go. So when you said that you guys did the exact same thing, you were just like basically living behind a curtain. You were doing almost the exact yeah. same thing. You guys could have gone out and picked out curtains together. Yeah, we, we could have lived behind <laughs> the same curtain. We could have been roommates behind the curtain, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's so funny, Love dude. It. What? So what What year is this, right? Just to give people a little bit of context of, you know, $600 in rent, $337,000 purchase price. Like this sounds like a few years ago, probably. Yeah, that was like 2017. So I was 25. Okay. 
Okay, so 2017, 25 years old. And so anyone listening to this that is in their early or mid 20s or maybe even in their late teens, like that's the time to get in when you don't mind living behind a curtain or living with a Ikea closet or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Um, and so or it sounds basement. like so or in the basement <laughs> even. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so and so just to you know, quick recap, $337,000 purchase price, a massive down payment of 67000 yeah. And that's just simply because you didn't know any better, right? Like Bigger Pockets wasn't what it was t- uh, in 2017 as it is today. There wasn't so much information about house hacking out there. There was no book on it. And so you kind of just like figured this thing out yourself. But you were living for free, right? You said you're getting eighteen hundred dollars a month in rent on a sixteen fifty payment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so, and how how was that living situation? Like, were were you like just take us through that like mental? People are like just getting into this. Yeah. Right. Like, what what can you prepare them for? Yeah, I think the most daunting thing is just trying to figure out leases, right? I, I was just like, I don't know how to do a lease. You know, I just want my buddies to move in, but my parents were adamant. You know, if you're going to have people living in there, you know if something goes wacky, you want to make sure that you actually have something in place to protect you. So I think it was more so just trying to get my first leases because right now I have all my properties under property management. And so I don't have to deal with the the legalities of it. But I think the most daunting thing for me was how do I, how do I formally set someone up to live in my house? How do I set up terms and boundaries? So if things do go haywire, someone has a girlfriend over every night and they're causing a ruckus, I have terms to actually get them out of there. Um, And also how do I restaff um, a new tenant in and make sure that it's compliant with all the other uh, people who are currently living there. So I think that was probably the most tricky part of house hacking for me. It wasn't really anything to do with the the purchasing or or um, living situation. Um, I, I would advise getting a cleaner though. I would I would advise building that into the rent of you know four hundred bucks a month and have them clean every week and break it out between the the roommates. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so where did you get this lease information? Because nowadays, you know, people can get them even where I live in Boulder. We have like a city official lease, but they've got them on apartments.com. You can get them a rocket lawyer and all that kind of stuff. What did you use? Yeah. You know, I um, one of my friends in the space had an extra lease and I, I literally just used that and I tweaked the verbiage. And so I didn't really have all the resources there um, that that was like legally binding that I knew that this lease was truly up to code, but, um, you know, it was better than nothing. And and I use that and the rest is history. I think that the number one thing that I, I, I could advise people is to just progress forward. You don't have to have all the answers at one time. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think a lot of times people get stuck in those small details, right? They're like, oh my gosh, well, now I have to hire a lawyer and we have mm-hmm. to do the lease perfectly. But honestly, leases... They hold people for a little while. If somebody is really kind of sketchy, they might not yeah. follow the lease anyway, right? It's just a piece of paper. So I wouldn't worry about every single word being just exactly perfect. You want to just keep moving forward. So I love that you said that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And so, you know, you, you lived in that house for a year. Was there any renovation or anything you did to it? You kind of were saying that the house was maybe a little bit janky with like the weird carpet in the basement and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was pretty turnkey. You know, I mean, it's just a typical rental. The cabinets were ugly um, and the deck was beat up. But um, overall, the only thing I had to do for renovations is it didn't have an air conditioning unit, uh, which was 4000 And then I had to do a sprinkler system, which, you know, probably about 2000 for that. Um, so yeah, I mean, just enough to get it up and running and humming. And um, the key for me was to try and get my savings rate up so I could save for the next down payment. So I really, I like going real cosmetic. I don't like to spend too much time and effort um, because the time value of money is better used on a future investment. Dude, I, I love that, man. I think a lot of investors, especially new investors, get caught up on what they're seeing on Instagram with people flipping houses or Mm-hmm. Um, what is that show like? Profit, whatever, flip and flop, whatever the flip, hell the show is called, right? Flip flop, flip hell, flop, yeah. flip and flop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like you know, like all you need to do is get like for a rental, for a buy and hold. All you need to do is like make it livable. Mm-hmm. Because if people are renting, they're not gonna, they don't really care that much about the the grand features. Correct. And so don't waste your money on all the crazy stuff. Just like get the house up and running so they can be comfortable. Mm-hmm. And that's it. I, I made that mistake. Yeah, and I think I know a lot of. People oh yeah, I've over renovated. <laughs> Yeah, and I do the same with Airbnbs. It's like I buy them turnkey ready to go because I want to just furnish it and get it rented. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people are going to spend three, six months down the road where they're paying that interest every month or they're paying their mortgage payment just to get it like up and running. So don't waste your time with that. Let's just 
get it going. Get yeah. it going. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, so so you move out in 2018. You move out of that property, mm-hmm. and it's cat. What do you rent? What, what do you rent your room out for? Or I guess so out. I didn't. Um, I didn't rent out. I, I just made everyone move out because I was actually sick of all of the independent leases. Um, and everyone has different life agendas and trying to sort with it. So when I bounced, I had everyone bounce, and I just leased it out to a single family. Okay, and what did you rent it for? Uh, at the time, I rent out for twenty one hundred. Okay, nice. so you were getting essentially the same amount then. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh wow. Okay. So so that's that's a that's an interesting point, right? And so that's kind of what happens. You know, that's why when you're going to do the rent by the room strategy, we like to recommend, hey, you want to get something with at least four or five bedrooms because you know Isaac kind of just proved the point there, where three bedrooms is kind of that break even point of like you can probably get about the same for three bedrooms, but if you do four or five, now you're getting incremental, and that's where your profit comes from. Um, and so, and I 100% do not blame you for <laughs> doing it with with what you had there. And so 2100 on a 1650 mortgage, you're cash flowing a couple hundred bucks after you set some aside for, you know, for expenses and all that good stuff. Yep. And so what happens uh, when you move out? Where do you move to? So I moved into a, a, a duplex. I had an agent that found an off-market deal and it was a duplex. And at the time, um, you know, everywhere I was looking, it was 15% down conventional for a duplex, 15% down conventional for a duplex. But what I didn't realize is that FHA, you can do multifamily for three and a half percent down for one to four units and duplex uh, worked for me. So what I wanted to do is lease out one side of the duplex and get a roommate, one roommate, not not as many as I had before on my side. Um, And the numbers worked out beautifully. I was living for free. The other property was cash flowing um, and I was in the same state. And I, I, I always say savings rate. The more that you can save a month, the more velocity that you're going to have in your portfolio, the faster you're going to go, the safer you are. So um, I always look to house hack um, in whatever way that I can, whether it's rent by the room was my first one, but duplex was the next best thing uh, to, to downsize uh, the quality of ten- or the, the amount of tenants that I was uh, living with. No, I love that, man. I love how you're kind of like, you know what you like, you know what your lifestyle is, and you're going to basically adhere your investment style to your lifestyle. And so what, Let's get into that duplex a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, you know, where was it? Um, how much? What did it cost? Let's get into the numbers. A little yeah, bit. yeah, this is a great one. So, I, I bought it for five hundred and twenty-five thousand. Uh, I put three and a half percent down, uh, plus your closing costs, and my overall mortgage on that one was, I think, right around three grand at the time. Um, I rented out the other side for uh, fifteen hundred, and then I had a roommate on my side for eight hundred. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I was pretty well buttoned up. I, my cash flow from my initial property was almost covering everything. Um, you know, cause there's still a little bit left over, um, after all of my tenants were paying on the duplex that I picked up and you're essentially living for free or a couple hundred bucks and your savings rate is about the same. Wow. So, okay. so your whole thing was just basically let's re- eliminate my rent expense. That's like, yeah, the cause and you didn't care much. Yeah, you yeah. care too much about cash flowing a thousand bucks a month or anything like that. You just knew that real estate, own real estate and wait, and, and you'll be you'll be wealthy. Yeah, I don't really live by the frugal mindset. Um, I that has never worked for me. I'm more of a hunter, so I just figure I'm in sales, so let's just go make more money. Mm, I love that. Z. Yeah, I wanted to kind of go back to the velocity and savings rate thing. It's like you didn't do this all perfectly to the maximum that you could, right? If someone's listening to our podcast or they're reading the house hacking strategy, they're gonna start it perfectly where they're only putting 3% down or 3.5% down. They're gonna maximize everything. They're gonna rent all the rooms. And even so, you were able to get to this place where now you're almost seven properties in, right? So it's like, you don't have to maximize everything. You don't have to kill yourself being frugal real estate is very forgiving. And then I, I love seeing that in your story. Yeah, I think that that's the, the, the key thing that I focused on is how do I clear my mind of distractions so I can earn more income? Because a lot of times in real estate investing, we talk about this frugal mindset of, you know, hey, how do I how do I get as lean as possible? And then you find a bunch of people that are making $50,000 a year trying to scale a portfolio. I'm trying to figure out how do I earn $250,000 a year of active income? 
you know, and then yeah. live for free. So then you're taking that savings rate and reallocating it into investment. So I focus more so on eliminating my housing expense, not necessarily optimizing cash flow to get one thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars a month per property. I'm more so just how do I live for free, eliminate my housing expense, and get my active income high. Okay, and so I guess I guess want to ask you one more question there because you said frugality wasn't a thing for you, but you still were living behind True. Not behind a curtain, but in the basement. Yeah. And so was that just because <laughs> was that just because you don't value like you know maybe you were a single guy you just didn't value that aspect of your life at that in that time in your life or like yeah it was a necessity because my active income had not risen to the point where I could afford to. Um, live on my own and afford a down payment on the next house and have reserves in the bank. So um, I think on my first couple of properties, I mean, I did um, my first was a single family and then I did a couple more duplexes. Those were typical, I mean, traditional house hacks, but they weren't optimized to the, the level of, you know, staffing six people in there, five people in there. Um, so yeah, I did have to be frugal at the beginning in order to catch up my active income to the point where I could sustain my lifestyle without roommates. So it's very important, like what you guys preach of getting roommates and getting your housing expense paid for, if not profiting on it is extremely important, particularly if your career isn't giving you the active income that you need in order to scale. Um, you need to obviously find income elsewhere, which is AKA house hacking, which is exactly the model that you guys talk about. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the more the more you spend, the more of a headwind you have in terms of hitting financial independence, the less you spend, maybe it becomes more of a tailwind. And so I think like that is just like the foundation of it. Right. Like no one wants to be maybe some people don't mind being frugal forever, but I don't I'm not that frugal anymore. No, me either. You know, believe it <laughs> or not, you know, believe it or not. I mean, I, I don't believe it. You yeah, you I actually the first time I we went to that coffee shop. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that that still happens. Like, I, I just don't care to like drink beer or anything that much. But like, I just spend on things of value. And so like, if I if I we, we have like a nice house now, we take nice vacations, we spend like that stuff I value. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I suspect you're the same way. And Z, I know you're the same way. So it's all about where you are in your journey. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so, Z, do you have anything to add? Otherwise, I'd love to kind of keep going and see sure where don't. Isaac goes next. All right. <laughs> All right, Isaac. So so we're heading into 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you mentioned that you're, you're like, t tell us a little bit about your job and kind of what you're doing. Um, yeah. Just, what is this active income that you're trying to increase? Yeah. So when I first got out of college, I started selling business to business sales. I was selling a payroll software. So um, basically people would pay their employees on a Friday and they need a software to deduct their W2, you know, their, their health insurance, uh, pull out their taxes, et cetera. So I was knocking on every mom and pop store trying to sell them our payroll software. And that's how I got started in sales. I cut my teeth and learned how to sell. So I did that for two years and I made decent money. Um, and then, you know, I, I blew it out of the water truly in my company two years in a row. And so I got picked up by a medical device company to go and sell to physicians. And so that's really when the active income started to um, be noticeable to the point that I didn't have to be quite so frugal because I had enough active income coming in to uh, fund my down payments and then also to uh, create reserves. So we're scaling uh, safely. Um, and so really medical device sales has been my bread and butter. And I still don't keep, uh, I keep my foot on the gas there. Um, you know, I double dip corporate um, and, I, and, and I also build my portfolio on the side because a lot of times people want to say, hey, I want to be a full-time real estate investor and they drop their active income and they're just relying on their passive income, but it's hard to qualify for loans and it's also hard to have velocity to scale a portfolio if you don't have that w2 income coming in so um, really uh, medical device sales and business to business sales has been key and then you pair that together with living lean if not positive in the green uh, i mean you're just set up for success to go hit a home run so i'm curious that if you're bringing in this high income does that change the way you buy your next duplex like did you go from a really kind of simple duplex to like a luxury duplex? <laughs> Believe it or not, I bought the ugliest duplex the next one, even when I was making good money. <laughs> I bought, okay. and, and actually, so I, I own um, three duplexes. So my first one, second one, and third one were all ugly. And they're all the same specs, and they're all in the same pocket. Um, and so all same lifestyle. I lived 700 square feet on each side. So I lived 
you know, in a small two bed, one bath, and then rented out the two bed, one bath on the other side. All of them are the same. I didn't increase my lifestyle. Um, I think that lifestyle inflation is just, um, it, it's a real thing. When you start to make more money, you want to have more luxurious uh, lifestyles, and that can really slow down the progression of a portfolio. But I tried to live within my means and keep the same quality of uh, duplex uh, that I was buying. Nice. I love that. I love that you were able to be disciplined like that because I know a lot of people have. And, and I think I think just being able to identify and recognize and put words to that lifestyle creep you can identify when you start, oh, okay, I'm starting to buy more stuff. Oh, you yeah, can almost yeah. be like, oh, yeah, I got I to dial, dial that back. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, on the sec, my third property, which was my second duplex, I put down 15% conventional on that one. Um, and I did so on, on my following duplex as well. And it just has to do with where you're at in your income streams, right? I mean, I think that it's good to put low down payments. Um, so then you leverage more debt, and you can, you know, have more money for reserves and repairs. But at the time, um, I had used my FHA loan, which was my three and a half percent. And so I was out of options, the only way to buy a duplex, in, unless I found one loan program that you can do otherwise, but uh, was 15% down. And all I knew is I, I cannot live with more people anymore. I'm done. I'm, I'm making good money. I can't live with four guys. I need a duplex. And so I just made it happen. And I, I was able to get 15% down payment, almost killed me. Uh, but that, that property now cash flows like a pig. So it's, um, you get your money back uh, when you put it down. It's just sometimes you're scraping the bottom of the barrel there. Yeah, yeah, you have to remember that the money you're putting down is equity in the house. Yeah. You know, a small portion of it might be closing costs and stuff. All right, man. So, you know, we talked about your first two deals. I think, you know, you were scrappy. A lot of people, I think, should start just exactly the way you do. We're like being fairly frugal, even though you kind of said you weren't, but I think you kind of were. Oh, uh, very. <laughs> uh, yeah, at least in the beginning. Yeah. And then, you know, you methodically pick up one or two. And now let's let's skip to something a little bit more recent, right? Let's get to a little bit more recent times. So let, let's talk about your most recent deal that you purchased. What did that look like? Yeah, so I'm, the the most recent deal I, is the one I'm in right now, um, <laughs> and I've upgraded my lifestyle a little bit. But what the reason why I got into this deal is it's a townhome, and everyone's been overbidding. I mean, Denver has just been absolutely crazy, and I didn't want to get into a price war because I'm trying to scale, right? So I bought a new build townhome. Um, and it's almost identical to my previous uh, townhome as far as um, the finishes and everything that it has. Um, so this is the one that I'm in right now is a three bedroom, three bathroom townhome. It's in an up, up, uh, uppity part of Denver, uh, young, trendy. Um, but what's awesome about the townhome that I'm in now is the previous house that I bought was just like it, but it had great zoning. And this zoning allows for short-term rental that's non-primary residence. And so that hmm. particular deal is my number one cash cow. I put down 5% conventional on it. And my mortgage on it is about $3,000. And I gross probably about $6,500 of income on that per month. Wow. And, you, and nice. you've got two properties that are like this. Correct. All right, man. Okay, so this this mysterious part of Denver um, yeah. that may or may not actually exist uh, <laughs> is where, I guess, tell us like what the purchase price looks like on those mm -hmm. on those properties, um, and tell us, yeah, tell us kind of like what those numbers actually look like, you know, and, and um, yeah, what it looks like when you're living there versus when you when you move out. Yeah, so I'll say when you move in, so I, I, I moved into these townhomes and I rent them out behind me, right? I, I, I short-term rental them out behind me. So when I moved into them, they're kind of heavy. I mean, like my very first short-term rental, I lived in on my own, right? It's my own primary residence and I bought it for 550000 So I was floating that payment is 2850 So for a single guy, 2850 on your own, you're like, Ugh, this is a little heavy. Like, I don't know if I can scale. Um, but the reason why I bought it is because um, this particular property, um, you can short-term rental as a non-primary uh, residence when you move out. So I was like, you know what? It's worth getting into this deal because I know the upside of it. So my savings rate was very, very low compared to what I was used to. But I knew, you know, after I move out of it, I'm going to recoup my costs um, and it's going to be a great hold for the long term. And so then I found a similar deal and I bought this one for 737000 My mortgage payment on it is $4,000 heavy. 
and I got a roommate to help take some, some edge off. Um, he only pays a thousand dollars a month. Um, but you know, it's enough for me to be able to manage it. Um, and then I can, I can turn around and do the same thing on this particular property. The reason why that I got into these townhomes was for two reasons. One is Denver was just so competitive that people were offering 30 or $40,000 above the asking price. And if that property doesn't appraise for that value, you have to cover the spread with cash. So you have your down payment plus the cash of the spread. It really will wipe you out. And most people can't do that. So what I wanted to do as a new build, lock in my fixed price and know exactly what my down payment is and then move on to the next one. Yeah, that sounds really smart. And one of the things I love about new builds, and this doesn't always happen, but it generally does, is that they're built in kind of sections, you know, in series. And so if you buy in at that first early section, you often get an equity bump every single time. So if they're finishing different parts of it, you're going to come out with a lot of equity like right out of the gate. So not only did you not overpay and deal with all that, and then you've got a place where you may not have much to repair for five, 10 years. So it's kind of a win-win. Absolutely. Yeah. And I will say on my duplexes, I have run into several repairs that, you know, are large um, sewage lines and different electrical um, bathroom uh, repairs. And so with a new build, it's been really nice to not have any of those repairs and it keeps you really lean. So you do your 5% down payment, you live in it for, you know, 10 months, get something else under contract, and then you're off to the races. You're really trying to be exactly like Craig, even sewage line problems. <laughs> don't put that yeah. on. I don't, I don't that. want any more. <laughs> yeah, it, it might be the opposite. Maybe I'm trying to be a lot more like Isaac is the real, the real way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, um, I mean, so, so it sounds like the base of the strategy is, is like you move into this place, you're buying it, you're still buying it with 5% down, mm-hmm. kind of a low down payment, right? Yep. Um, you're still doing that traditional type, not traditional house hack, but the, all the house hacking methods. Um, you're going to get a roommate while you're living there. So you're not, you're not having an Airbnb in the place that you live just when you move out is then when you put it into an Airbnb. Is that right? Correct. Yep. That's correct. And so you mentioned the first one was 550. This one was in the 700s. Mm -hmm. So why is it so much more if it's very similar finishes and stuff? Was it just what the market was doing or are you kind of in a different area? Different area. Yeah. Different area where people are renting more uh, by the room, you know, uh, in a trendy part of Denver, people are paying anywhere from $1,300 to $1,500 a room. Um, So I bought the second one in a more trendy area. Um, so I felt more comfortable going with a higher price point there. Nice. Sounds good. And now, um, let's say those rules change and they say, actually, you know what? We don't want to allow any more short term rentals. Mm -hmm. Do you have a plan B? Yeah. And this is really important. This is how I buy all of my properties is if you have to revert back to a 12 month lease, it still must break even. Um, so all my properties, I buy them and I do cosmetic lipstick. So even on my new builds, um, I will basically deck them out with mounted TVs, um, anything that I need to enjoy it while I'm here. And then if I, for some reason need to convert it back to a 12 month lease, I can always lease it out fully furnished and break even or be positive in my cash flow position. And I do want to highlight that often when places do make the regulation switch and they say, oh, you know, we're making these illegal, they will often grandfather people in that have already been doing it. So that Mm -hmm. happened to me in Colorado Springs. And that's really a great advantage because now no new places can come in. So we don't have any more competition, but we are one of the OGs that that have a license. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Z. I love, dude, I love, I love to hear kind of where you're at and where your strategy's going and all that kind of stuff. And, and I want to remind people that this entire time, like Isaac is working a W2. So, you know, like real estate investing doesn't even take most of your, it's not, it doesn't take up most of your time. That's what we've been talking about. But most of your time, I, I suspect is still selling medical devices. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, as far, you guys are so good about your cash flow. I think that's the one thing that I've always appreciated about you, Craig. Um, is you've always found a way to find cash flow, and that is so important. One of the things that I had to do is I had to take a haircut on my cash flow in order to standardize because the majority of my units are all 12 month leases. And when you have duplexes and you got three of them, I mean, that's six families that you're managing. 
Um, and so I had to take a haircut on my cash flow by outsourcing to a property manager. But it just this peace of mind so I can go out and I can crush it in my job. And because I would rather go out with peace of mind and make an extra 60, 70 grand in commission um, than to be bogged down and not focused and miss out on that active income because all that I care about is my next down payment. Nice. So I'm curious, like, what is the next step? You did a single family home, then you did duplexes. Now you're doing some Airbnbs. Are you going to go out of state? Do you want 10 places? What's kind of the goal? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm kind of old school. So my goal is to get to 10 primary residents, uh, owner occupied properties. Um, so by the time that I get to my 10, my first five will be ready to do a cash out refinance. I'll probably pull out about 125, 150,000 from each property and mirror that for property one through 15. Mm, okay. And so Can you're, you you're just reciting that. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I guess a lot of times there's not an end game, right? It's, we're just talking about how do we get more cash flow? How do we get more cash flow? But in my opinion, I think we need to get up upwards of $10 million worth of assets under control. And so we can get our equity positions higher up so we can start doing larger. I want to do larger deals. I want to do apartment complexes, but I want to do them on my own. I really don't like partnering with people because I think that there's too many uh, variables in life um, that I think it's better just to run your run your show on your own. So what I figure is I, I'm going to buy my next. Um, so I need to buy property seven, eight, nine and ten, all at small down payments. I'm talking five percent. So you get 10 properties under control. By the time that you get to your 10th property, property one, two, three, four, and five, you bought them at 5% equity, they're probably upwards of 35 to 45% equity. So what do you do? You leave 20% equity in your house and you reallocate the excess equity, which is tax-free, into a future down payment. So you can overnight, by the time that you get your 10 first primary residences, you can buy 11 through 15. So now you have 15 properties that are all allocated um, to gaining equity and cash flow, and you're well on your way to becoming a big wig real estate investor. Right. And so, and it sounds so, so this is almost like the, a long term. It's like, it's like how you can burr without actually doing any rehab, kind of, right? Because mm -hmm. the market likely, especially in Denver, will appreciate enough in five years, or frankly, it's 10 years. Right, mm -hmm. uh, so that you can then you know keep real reallocating, reallocating, reallocating. Correct. And so I think that's a I think that's a brilliant strategy. Yeah. And, and again, the the only caveat there is that you probably do need to stick to your W two mm -hmm. or somehow qualify for all those loans traditionally. Um, um, but hey, it sounds like you know if you if you're loving that W two or you're making a lot of money at it like you are, it's well worth it. Yeah, I've been a fan of double dip. I just, I really don't see um, if you, if I were to jump from my job right now, I could probably make something work, but if something is working, just stick it out another five more years and, and just continue to play the long game because I want my 40 year old self to be just really happy and proud that I stuck to the game plan and I actually accomplished it versus jumping prematurely at something that's a shiny object. And then, you know, you, you you become the shell of what you could have been. And I would say that's like why you want to start early if you can, because people I find have a lot of momentum in their 20s. You know, yeah. they're excited, they're hungry, they're doing stuff. And maybe other people hold that all through 30s. I'm already like, mm, I want to hang out. Yeah. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it depends on who the person is. But um, I think if you start early, it makes it so much easier for you to enjoy the rest of your life in a peaceful way. Yeah. And and I think the thing yeah. too is like money is money. We can all agree money's money. So like you have one house and it goes up $35,000 in equity, you know, a year. I don't know. When's the last time that you did nothing and made 35 grand as this is real yeah. cold, hard cash All the like, last two years. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> if, if each house is going to go up, you know, 35,000 or $50,000 a year, like we've been seeing, obviously that's not always realistic, but that's real money. And so when you get to the point where you have 10 assets under control, 
and the market goes up by 5%, I mean, you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars of cold, hard cash that you didn't do anything for. So while yes, I'm interested in cash flow, and I think that cash flow is absolutely a necessity to, um, you know, scale faster. I think that I look at it as a more holistic view of saying, hey, how do I get as many assets under under uh, my control as I can, make sure that they're all profitable, and make sure that I have six months of reserved mortgage payments for every property so I never worry about, you know, uh, if, if market rents drop, can I cover that? Absolutely. If I have a pipe that bursts, no problem. So I'm more so thinking in the long term of what does my 40 or 45 year old self want? And that's a lot of properties. Um, and then the cash flow will come when you reallocate that equity into bigger deals. Right. And so I do, I do want to mention one thing is that when you do reallocate the, the, those, um, those deals, your cash flow on those initial deals will obviously go down, right? Because mm -hmm. your monthly payment will be higher, but you're able to get more properties that will cash flow to replace that. And then you've got, you know, two properties with the same dollar that are now increasing in equity and tax benefits and all that other glorious real estate stuff. Yeah. So like, let's say, let's say that you're cash flowing, um, something nice with your cash flowing a thousand dollars a month. And then let's say that you do a cash out refinance and now you're only cash flowing $500 a month for easy math. So that's a Delta of $500. Well, I can tell you what, by reallocating that capital into a different house, you're making a lot more money. And so I think that that's where a lot of people get hung up on is they don't want to lose their current interest rates. They're worried about their beautiful cash flow of $1,000 a month. But I can guarantee you reallocating that equity, the time value of money on that money that's sitting in lazy equity is much better suited being put into another deal and using that velocity of your money to go and make more money. Love that. I love that. This yeah, is equity, the velocity episode. <laughs> this is the velocity. I love velocity. That's, Let's go fast. Yeah. Fast Let's go see. back. Yeah. <laughs> Isaac's middle name is velocity. Uh, uh, all right, man. Well, I think we're going to head into, so, so, you know, I guess just like a little bit of a recap, right? I mean, you're just kind of like, you're like, I mean, you're more of like the house hacking guy than I am, honestly. Like you've done seven, six going on seven house hacks. I've done six. I, I've now thrown in the flag. I don't think I'm going to do any yeah. more house hacks. Uh, we, we kind of bought our forever place. Um, but, you know, um, but like that's that, that's your journey and that's it. And so you kind of like, again, I feel like our stories are so damn similar, so right? Similar. Started off in 27, 2017, living behind a curtain, scrappy yeah, as hell, right? It. Just to get the next property and the next property. And every year you just systematically buy another one. It increases cash flow. It increases appreciation, all that good stuff. And I mean, Dude, just curious, man. I just got an appraisal back for my first property um, like, a, like less than a week ago. And I'm curious as to what yours came is at now ish if you have yeah it's recently. um it's worth about 550 550,000 i buy for 337 okay. so 345 so yeah we want to uh, 200 200,000 yeah so 200,000 in 5 years to do nothing doing nothing yeah right um and I, I was a little more fortunate. I, mine went from uh, 385 I bought in like a really shady part of Denver <laughs> five years ago that now is a, a nice, really nice part of Denver. Uh, and it went from 385 I just got an appraisal back at 800 oh. And I was like, holy daddy, smokes. Daddy. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I, that's almost 100 grand a year. <laughs> that is like a salary for a, a really good salary for a lot of people. And I've done nothing except, you know, Fix a little bit of sewer issues and maybe some noise issues, but overall, like I'm in the I'm in the positive. Awesome, so man, that's so good, and yeah, that's why we that's why we started like teaching people because I I started just like you guys, like we start making some money in real estate, and you realize like man, th this is the easiest dollar you can make, um, truly, mm -hmm. because you can go out and you can slave over you know doing a startup business or whatever you want to do, but I tell you, the easiest and the most proven model is always going to be real estate. And that's why we started this company because we just wanted to educate people on how do you start investing in real estate and how do you take away the barriers to entry? Because there's so many misconceptions about real estate that says that, hey, you, you know, this is for rich people to do. This is for someone other than you. But it's not true. It's all about just truly educating yourself to understand that you can do this, but it's actually the simplicity of real estate that keeps most people from it because it's so simple that no one wants to do it. They want the the glitzy, glamorous, startup, techie thing. All I know, you save up down payment, you put it down on a house, and you do that as many times as you can. 
I love that, man. I love that. And so, you, you know, you're, you, what is this company now? And so t- tell us a little bit about this. Yeah. So me and, and two friends um, who are in real estate, we started this company called Money Mailbox. And it's a real estate education company that we produce <laughs> courses, uh, video courses to help people on their real estate journey. Because what I found is that the practical advice just wasn't quite there. I was kind of piecing together from every angle and reading all these books. And I was trying to figure out how to formulate my strategy. But what I really wanted is just someone to tell me what to do. And that's how Money Mailbox came to fruition is we just decided, hey, let's create some courses to help people buy houses. Um, And so we created video courses for that. And then we we have our own in-house agent that we were able to help our clients actually find properties that we would want to buy, but we just didn't have the money for. And we would help them get into those homes. And what's really cool is we're able to help them on their journey of real estate investing and get started and all of a sudden you realize that it's not really that complex you just need a little guidance and that's why we started money mailbox mm, i love that's that great. dude yeah man i love i love that you're like you're taking what you learn i think i think that's so important is that as you go on your journey there's so many people that have helped you out oh, and, yeah. and things were better for you than they were 10 years before you and now like your mission and my mission and z our mission is to make it easier for the generation after us. And so now it's much easier than it was when we were starting out. And I think just having that flow is amazing and just making sure that you contribute some part to that to give back, I think it's amazing. Yeah, it's really important. And I I think that the thing that I most appreciated is when someone went out of their way to help me. And I think that that has just done so much for my gratitude because you start to enter into a realm and you guys are probably getting into it too. And you start to realize that you're starting to take off. And it's not any bit of an ego thing, but it is money is money and it, and it, and it does matter. And it's really nice to have that just humble moment when you realize like, man, if I could help one person get into their very first house hack, kind of like what you guys are talking about, it's like, it really does change someone's life. Um, and real estate has changed all of our lives. Um, I always laugh mm-hmm. because I, I'll have buddies that, and they're like, Hey man, I just landed this dope job. Um, and they're making some great money. Absolutely phenomenal. And then you kind of look at things side by side and you think like, man, I think my houses are pretty, they're producing pretty good too, you know? So you don't have all that pressure (laughs) of having to always take that next job because sometimes the next job at the next promotion is going to take way more than it gives you. Yeah, it's going to give you some more money, but it's going to take 80 hours a week of working. And so what real estate has really helped uh, me do, and I know a lot of people do, is have a more sane mind when it comes to your W-2 job and say, hey, as long as Craig can save up for that 5% down payment next year and he has some money for his reserves and repairs, he doesn't need to take that next job because he's worried about buying the next house, not necessarily jumping out every flashy object that pays more that he's going to hate his job for. So I think that real estate also is very complimentary with a W-2 job and taking some of that pressure off of having to take that next promotion. Hmm. I love that, man. Such an interesting perspective. Yeah, it makes it makes working a lot more fun when you don't like have to do it, mm-hmm. right? Or you don't. Yeah, you can. You can just. You just. You're still living exactly like just because. I, I don't know like where your cash flow number is at. I would love to hear that if you're yeah. if you're willing to share. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where is that at actually? Yeah, my my monthly cash flow is about five thousand okay. dollars, depending on repairs. Okay, so about five thousand dollars a month. I'd say like you're pretty damn close, if not there like you could be financially independent if you had to like if you lost your job you could move to a you know maybe a less crappy a crappier place rent out your place and like definitely like you've got ways to be like financially independent in a second if um if you wanted to so you know just because you're working a w-2 job doesn't mean that you're not financially independent and you're not loving every life loving your life like you're doing exactly what you want to be doing and i just think that's amazing and again and there's no stress which again that's you look good. So I think that, you know, that you can tell that it doesn't seem like you're very stressed out. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Guys, you need to cool watch man. the so, video. He's a handsome man, you know? Check out our yeah, YouTube very, channel. Yeah. Get a load yeah. of Thank Isaac. You. Yeah, I'll try not to break the camera here. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. I think having the having the W2 job too, you know, I, I really enjoy interacting with people um, on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. I, I just love being out and about. And then all of a sudden you're, you're interacting with people and they think you're kind of unique because you're a W two person, but my, my mind isn't really on my W two job so much. It's more so on like, 
all right, well, how do I create this side business? Because it's really the side business that's going to take care of your family when you're 40 or 50 years old. I don't really see real estate investing as something that's like, wow, this is really impacting, impacting Isaac right here and right now. All I want to know is at 45 years old, you know, when, you, when you've got a, a bunch of real estate and it's, and it's paying all your bills, that's what I, what I live for. I don't really live for today of feeling like, man, this is life changing money. I'm more so I'm just saying my 45 year old self is going to look back at my 25 year old self and say, job well done. Well, job well done. I'll tell you right now. And it's time for us to move into our final part of the show. Uh So, Craig, are you ready (laughs) for the final four? The final four. The final four. All right. So, Isaac, what are you reading right now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's actually, Isaac is it, not reading. Look at his face. <laughs> He's trying to come up with a lie, read. guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Um, I, I um, A fun fact about me is the only book that I read is the Bible. Um, so it depends on what, what time of the year that I'm, I'm in. And um, right now I re- I'm reading Revelation. Well, I'm glad that that's true because it sounds a little Miss America where you're like, the only thing that I want is world yeah, peace. Daisies so and world, world peace and I... pancakes for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm yeah. glad. Okay. Yeah. So that's the only book that I read. Yeah. Um, I, I get most of my information on like podcasts and YouTube and stuff. Um, I find that my right. retention to, um, to information that's like pertinent to real estate investing or finance or anything like that. Um, I can generally get it summed up from a quick YouTube video. So I don't really like wasting my time uh, with that or I'll jump on a, you know, uh, something like what you guys are talking about um, and learn a new strategy here in five minutes um, just to sit down and come okay. through a t- 250 page book to try and extrapolate out something of, of context that I could use. I don't think it's a great use of my time. So I try and find my information elsewhere and, um, and then I just read the Bible um, on my own. Awesome. I've got, a, I've got a question about your Bible reading, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, when you, when you read, are you reading, like, do you read like one, um, like, do you read like one, what is it called? Like one passage or are you trying to like dig deep into like one little part of it or, or how does that go for you? Great question. Great question. Normally I read a, a book at a time. So like, you know, for a couple months, I'll read the book of John, uh, for a couple months, I'll read Genesis. Um, you know, wh- whatever, um, I, I, I try to focus on just one particular book. Um, but for each day, generally I'll read one chapter and then explain it back. Um, because I think that mm-hmm. when you read something, it's one thing to read it. It's another, if you can explain it. Um, so if you can explain mm-hmm. what's actually happening, um, in that particular chapter, then you truly understand it. And I think that's been the most fun part about the Bible is as a Christian, we believe that the, it's the word of God. It's alive. So it's fun because it never gets old. Mm. I love that, man. Love it. Um, Okay. Second question. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Mm, Best piece of advice that I've ever received is the next step of faith is always the hardest. It's always the hardest. So like whether you're thinking about your first down payment and you're like, I don't know if I can do this, or you're thinking like, man, maybe I should boot up this podcast, but I feel like I'm going to be intimidated because I don't know if it's going to make me feel bad if I can actually do this. Or maybe it's, Hey, I want to, I want to go on a trip, but I don't know if I can do this. I've always heard that the next step of faith is always the hardest. Um, and so just focus on what's that next obstacle where you, it seems a little scary, a little daunting. And generally, if you can get over that mental hurdle, it's going to free you up to a whole different set of options that's contingent on that one step of faith of, of taking action uh, and stepping out. Mm, I love that, man. Love it so much. All right. Well, I have an idea about this one, but what would you say is your why? Hmm. Yeah, I, um, my greatest fear is unrealized potential. And I think that my why isn't necessarily to say that, that I'm worth $15 million. Um, I think my why is to look back at my life and just not have any regrets um, of a life uncapped. You know, on a car, there's a governor, right? So it doesn't go too fast. So like an Audi might top off at, you know, 120 but that thing could push more. It's just, they put a governor on it. And I think that that's the, the one thing in my life I really want to do is just eliminate my, my own governor of my own life and just see truly, if you, if you live a life that you, that you really go for it, what does that truly look like? And I think that that's the why for me is I just want a life unhindered. Mm-hmm. Love that, man. Okay. Last question. Where is the most embarrassing place you've ever farted? 
Oh, man. Uh, I wouldn't say farted, but I literally shat myself one time in PE class. <laughs> It was like a, it was like a high school. I was like a freshman or sophomore, and we were all sitting on like the basketball court, and uh, and like we we're getting ready for them to like take attendance for like our thing. And I trusted a fart, and I shouldn't have. And unfortunately, they locked the locker room, so you can't go in and like you know uh, tamper with people's clothes and stuff. And so I, you can you can play out the rest, but that's where I trusted a fart, and I shouldn't have. Oh man, <laughs> that's awesome! I love that. Oh man, I love, I love that, that question. question. That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. What? Uh, where can people find out more about you? You mentioned Money Mailbox. Um, you know, how, how do we? How do they get, take a look at that and all yeah. that good stuff? Awesome. Thanks for asking. So um, if you want to find me, uh, my real estate company, along with my two business partners is called Money Mailbox. And you can find us on Instagram at Money Mailbox um, or online at www.themoneymailbox.com. Um, tons of resources on there for you, as well as some courses. Um, if you want to follow me on my personal, my Instagram is Isaac, I-S-A-A-C, Abron, A-B-R-A-N. That's my middle name. So uh, thanks so much. All right, man. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It was so great to catch up and to hear what you've been doing these last couple of years. Yeah, man. It's good to see you. It's been awesome. It's been so fun to watch your journey. <laughs> Dude, same, man. We're going to have to uh, we'll have to catch up in person next time I'm down in Denver. So, um, yeah, you too, Z. I'd yeah, love man. to. Great. Awesome. All right, dude. Uh, thanks so much for coming on, and we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. All right. That was Isaac Archuleta. He's got a funny last name, and I can even pronounce it. Z, what do you think about Isaac? I'm just really proud of you for getting that out and for just your, your super hype today. I don't know if this is like the new Craig or if this is just Craig plus Z, but I'm appreciating the hype, man. <laughs> I think I think I think it's just like me missing you, like being back and seeing your face Aww. and talking to you, and it's just it puts me in a good mood, Z. Yeah. What a cutie! Well, I thought Isaac yeah. was also a cutie, and he had a great story. It seems like. You know, he's just got a really methodical plan. I felt like all of his talk about velocity and using your savings rate to kind of push you forward, it seems like he had just a really great way of thinking about um, his future and, and planning out for his 45-year-old self. So I really liked just kind of his story there. Yeah, I, I love that he's super intentional um, and he doesn't chase a lot of shiny objects. A lot of people start actually get their third, fourth, fifth properties. They get they start to get really confident and they're like, hey, I want to go start raising money and doing syndications. I mean, I'm, I'm in that boat, right? Like, uh, and start wanting to do all this stuff and grow faster and grow bigger and grow stronger. But he's kind of like, no, I don't want that stress. Like, I don't want that. That's that's not part of my plan. My plan is going to be, I'm going to continue to house hack once a year. For 10 years, he's going to house hack. And then he's going to use the profits from his first house hack to then funnel into the second. And you can use, like, in a 10-year period, real estate is likely going to go up. And so almost in every scenario, you're going to be able to refinance that first house and get the second one and the third and the fourth and all that good stuff. And so I I, I mean, I, I admire what he's doing. Yeah, I think it's really smart. It kind of made me go, dang, I should have been doing 10 owner-occupied loans. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> yeah, that's super, it's super efficient. Time. Can't do it all. You can't do everything. And everyone's journey is different and it works for them. And so he really loves working on his W-2. Z, if I know anything about you, I can't imagine anyone telling you what to do would go very well. So um, <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, everyone's journey is different and I think that's super important. But it's good to hear other people's journeys and take bits and pieces and, and make your own. So, Z, anything else you want to add before we uh, hop off for this week? Uh, no, I just want to go take a shower because I'm here in uh, the middle of a heat wave in Europe and it's not as glamorous as it sounds. So I'm going to do that, guys. <laughs> All right. And uh, Z's going to go shower. And what we want you to do is leave us a rating and review on iTunes and let us know that you did. Shoot us a message on Instagram. I'm the Fi Guy. Ziana is Ziana McIntyre. And we will see you guys all next week. That's it for this episode of Investify. We hope that these nuggets of real estate wisdom lead to more savvy financial planning and a clearer path towards financial freedom. For more content like this, subscribe to the show at investify.com. Don't forget to leave a rating and share it with your friends. 
Together, we can transform more real estate newbies into successful and clever investors. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next one.